Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Wesley United Methodist Church Sunday worship. We truly hope that uh, you have come from a blessed week and are headed into good days ahead. Last Sunday, early morning thunder and lightning storms here in Northern California was really quite alarming and tragic as as many as uh, over a th uh, 10,000 lightning strikes caused numerous wildfires, which firefighters are still uh, battling um, and trying to get under control, especially difficult with the heat and the heavy winds as well. Um, the last I read, over 46,000 acres in Northern Cal were burned. Uh, needless to say, all of us here in San Jose experienced uh, a lot of smoke in the air throughout the week, even though our homes may not have been threatened. But so we do pray for all whose lives have been affected by another major setback. Please, please pray for all who have been devastated by these fires. And please pray for our firefighters out there um, fighting the fires and trying to help evacuate people. So our thoughts and prayers are with all of those folks uh, this day and throughout the, the days ahead. Um, let me say thank you to all of you uh, for your continued support of our church budget this year during the pandemic, for your support of our community outreach uh, projects like our Tuesday food distribution and our St. James Park ministry uh, to the homeless, um, uh, for your donations to our mission, church mission fund that uh, helps to support other mission projects and other local organizations that we are uh, supporting. Thank you to all of you who um, really participate on as members of committees and various ministries of our church for joining us on chats and helping to check in with other people in the church. You know, those means of support and uh, staying in connection with each other just are so vital to ensuring that everybody in our congregation is doing well. So thank you, thank you, thank you for for doing your part to to help keep our congregation safe, but, but also in connection. Um, we are keeping our church moving forward in spite of the adversities that we are facing. We are participating in conversations and work to promote greater uh, racial equality. We are pressing forward. We really are. Um, please know that. And we are doing our best um, to keep our community safe from COVID-19. We are creating safe ways to conduct even memorial services and weddings as well. So uh, know that uh, our church is doing okay. Uh, thanks to you. Uh, next week, our youth and youth um, and youth ministry directors and counselors, they will lead us in worship as they share about their church uh, camping, uh, youth camping experience, which was done virtually this past year. Um, the camping programs that our kids participate are the National Japanese American United Methodist camping programs, which are one junior high camp and two Asian camp, which is our senior high and early college camp. Um, so the kids had a great time and you'll get a chance to hear from them next week. Uh, next weekend also is our local Silicon Valley Pride weekend. And that is going to be filled with numerous digital events and programs of celebration in light of this pandemic you can go to um, www.svpride.com to see the schedule um, uh, of the online events. As one reconciling church within our United Methodist Church denomin dom denomination, we are one of many churches across this country of ours who welcome all and do affirm the sacred worth of uh, our LGBTQ plus uh, siblings uh, and persons, no matter your sexual orientation or your gender Id identity, you are welcome at Wesley United Methodist Church, San Jose.
We honor who you are, your relationships and marriages, and celebrate and encourage you to share your gifts and talents, your leadership and your faith through our ministry. Truly, we believe that you add to the goodness of the ministry here. We encourage and support you in the ways that God may be calling your life to a passionate witness and service of ministry. Our decision to join the ranks of other United Methodist churches by declaring ourselves a reconciling United Methodist Church was a decision made back on October 8, 2013. But I want to add that the desire to express welcome to our LGBTQ plus siblings of faith, that was a process of becoming that was nurtured even decades earlier by former pastors and the laity of our church. And therefore, it was without question a common, commonly held conviction of our congregation that had been nurtured long before it was even ratified by an official vote. But let me say this. The fact that we had taken that vote in 2013 with a bold public declaration um, that we have coveted ever since, that has been a tremendous blessing to our church family and ministry as many LGBTQ plus friends and allies have joined our church and become such active and faithful members of our congregation serving in many areas of ministry. We are a better and a stronger church because of this important decision. Our witness to God's love in Jesus Christ has grown tremendously. Thank God we really do um, know that God's Spirit is working here at Wesley in wonderful, magnificent ways. This uh, week, many of our local Reconciling United Methodist Churches will participate in the Silicon Valley Pride Weekend digital programming through the contribution of a video submission from our churches celebrating pride. So, here is the video you can see right now. Happy Pride! I'm Brian Adkins, Senior Pastor at Willow Glen United Methodist Church, and I'm here to let you know that no matter what's happening in your life, no matter where you've been or where you're going, there's a place for you in God's story and in our United Methodist Churches. You are welcome, you are blessed, and you are beloved. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. This year we are celebrating equality rising as the Supreme Court ruled in favor of LGBTQ plus work non-discrimination. Yet we continue to find discrimination that impacts and limits our queer lives, including our spiritual and faith identities. Today, however, Nearly every faith tradition offers at least some branch that is welcoming. I hope and pray that you might care for not just your mind and body, but your spirit as well. May it too rise to a God that equally cherishes you as their beloved. You are God's beloved child. In Reconciling United Methodist Churches, you are welcomed, affirmed, and celebrated for who you are. Come and join us. Happy Pride. The truth and beauty of standing up for equality and justice is real. We see you standing and choose to stand with you. You are awesome. You are magnificent. You are loved. You are welcome here. You belong here. You are welcome here. 성소수자 여러분 모두를 환영합니다. You belong here. All are welcome. You are welcome here. 我们欢迎你. You are welcome. You are welcome here. Soy pastor hispano metodista y apoyo a la comunidad LGBTQ. You are welcome here. You belong here. You belong here. You are welcome here. We're welcome. Good job. You are welcome here. Lagi kang tinatanggap dito. 
Happy Pie! the call to worship. Rejoice people of God. In Christ there is hope and peace. But how can we rejoice? The world is full of hunger, agony, conflict, pain. Rejoice people of God, for in God there is, it, it is justice and love. God is the source of everything. But how? The problems are big and the, the injustice overwhelming. Rejoice people of God, for in you Christ lives and all things are possible. Rejoice, we are God's tools of justice and love. Through God, we can work for peace and serve one another. We miss you guys and we hope we see you soon. Good morning. Let us pray. God of abundance and mercy, we acknowledge your presence among us today. Open our eyes to see the path before us. Deepen our faith to walk with you upon this path. Strengthen our hearts with courage to embark on the journey. Enlarge our hearts with gratitude for your provision along the way. Teach us these things today, O oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Happy Sunday. Now, I know most of you have started school already, so I hope it's off to a great start learning from home. So I have a question. How many of you like to do dot-to-dot -dot puzzles? Yeah? Lots of you, that's awesome. They're a lot of fun, right? First you find the dot, mark number one, and then you find the next one, so it would be number two, and so on and so on, until you've connected all of the dots and it's created a picture. Well, I have a dot-to-dot -dot picture that I want to share with you, and I want you to see if you can guess what it is. It has 14 dots. Yes, of course. It's a car. That was a little easy because most of the car was already drawn for you. So let's try another. This one has 21 dots and there's less drawing. So let's see how well you can do. Yes, you're right again. It's an ice cream cone. Uh, it even had more numbers, but you're so smart. I know the shape must have given it away though. So this week as I was looking for different dot-to-dot -dot puzzles, I discovered extreme dot-to-dots. So I have an extreme dot-to-dot -dot puzzle to share with you. And you know what? It has 985 dots. That's a lot of dots. OK, 
Can you guess what it is? I don't know either. You know, sometimes we feel like a dot to dot puzzle. Sometimes we know where we're going, but sometimes we have no idea. We don't have a clue. And when you're older, many people often wonder, what are they supposed to do with their life? Sometimes life is unclear and we feel like we're in the middle of a dot to dot puzzle, an extreme dot to dot puzzle. But you know what? Our faith tells us that God has a plan for us. God has a plan for me and God has a plan for you. We need just to listen to where God is leading and we need to trust that God's plan will challenge us to grow into being the best persons that we can be. You know, we may not know yet what God's plan in, for us is, but we know that when we are part of God's plan, that we will make a difference in the lives of others. Let's join in prayer led by one of our God's Garden children. Dear God, thank you for this time to worship together. This morning we are reminded about the hope and plans you have for each of us. When we are lost or confused on our journey, help us to listen to your leading. Challenge us to grow into our potential. Help us trust the plans you have for us. Thank you for always being by our side. Amen. Testament scripture reading from Exodus chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 10. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase and in the event of war join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, 
They set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramesses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women, and see them on the birth stool. If it is a boy, kill him, but if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw a child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because, she said, I drew him out of the water. May God bless the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Amen. The voice of God is calling its summons in our day. Isaiah in Zion, and we now hear God say, Whom shall I send to succor my people in their need? Whom shall I send to is a passing hour, but 
you can use our weakness to magnify your power from ease and plenty save us from pride of place absolve purge us of low desire lift us to I resolve take us and make us holy teach us your will and way speak and behold we answer command and we This morning, our scripture reading is the assigned Old Testament reading from the lectionary. Remember that three-year um, cycle of sets of scriptures that is assigned for each Sunday and each special day of the Christian calendar year that gives us exposure to a great diversity of scripture from all parts of the Bible. And it also provides a designed unity among many um, mainline Christian denominations, both Protestant and Catholic, who might very well be focusing on the same selection of passages each Sunday. I do like that about the lectionary, though I am willing to abandon the lectionary reading if another passage seems to be more relevant to the times that we are living in um, from week to week. But for the most part, I do turn to the lectionary readings first. So as I was looking up the lectionary readings this week, I was reflecting upon this assigned Old Testament reading, and I began to ponder the birth narrative portion of the story of Moses. You know, the, you know, the person who is called by God to confront the Pharaoh of Egypt, to free the oppressed and enslaved Israelites from their bondage in Egypt, which, spoiler alert, he was able to do, as many of you already know. But it wasn't a simple task, was it, as you remember? It definitely, it definitely wasn't like, hey, Pharaoh, let my people go, and the Pharaoh easily um, ac accommodating Moses by saying, sure. No, not at all. <laughs> as you know, it took a lot of confrontation, a lot of action, powerful acts of God, and more, to get the Pharaoh to submit to these demands. You see, the welcome that was extended to the Israelites at the time of Joseph, Joseph, who was the son of Jacob, they had changed dramatically as the Israelites became more populous. And the welcome soon changed to racism, xenophobia, fear, and hate. Yes, this is story I think has a lot of relevance to our time, doesn't it? Anyway, this part of the Moses story, which the Noda family read, and, and thank you, Noda family, this part of the Moses story is often left out when summarized um, as, it, as the Moses story is such a lengthy narrative as a whole in the Old Testament. Um, or let me say at least that much of the details of this, early, this beginning section are oftentimes left out in order to get to the meat of the Moses story. And yet, and yet, this part of the story is so very important, I think. It reminds us that even when Moses was born, there would be a purpose to his life that he would not fully grasp until much later in his life. In fact, perhaps the fullness of, of what God had asked him to do might not even be fully understood until the very end of his life, I think. The, the, this beginning of the Moses section um, of his story is so important because it reminds us that the hand of God is watching over Moses from infancy that Moses will, would fulfill the call and destiny that he would be asked by God to bear. I think we, we can all understand that, that we all might understand more fully the meaning and the purpose of our own lives when we look back at our life um, uh, in the past. 
when we look at the road behind us, so to speak, where we have journeyed, and then we can see the signs and the patterns that we missed while traveling down the road. We miss seeing the hand of God that was paving the road when we had walked. Certainly we get that impression um, of Moses' life. When I was a child, <clears throat> I can't remember having aspirations to be a great athlete, athlete or a fireman <laughs> or anything like that. Certainly I hadn't a clue that ministry was even a thing to consider. I mean, um, I heard and read about kids who's had aspirations to be a preacher from childhood. Well, certainly not me. <laughs> when you when you were a child, do you remember what you told others um, you wanted to be when you grew up? <laughs> Here's a thought. <laughs> Why don't you type in the chat <laughs> what you want what you thought you wanted to be when you were, were a kid i'd love to see that and and see how that is so different from what you have done or what you are doing now well because my father was a physician a family doctor in the community and because my mother was a nurse and because so many other extended family um, members uh, were in the m medical field Medicine was perhaps the only path that I foresaw as a child. So the earliest recollection of what I wanted to be um, was unwaveringly a doctor, and more specifically, a pediatrician. That was the occupation that was in my head since I was young, and certainly all the way up to entering college. In fact, when I applied to college, I applied as a bioscience major. I thought with certainty that I needed to have a bio -sci undergraduate's degree to pave the way to applying and entering medical school. But something went awfully awry in my first year of college. The good grades that I had gotten when I was in high school in the areas of science and math suddenly seemed to have little bearing on my success in biology in college. Seriously, I, I felt that a power switch had been turned off and I felt incapable of grasping anything in my field of study. It sent me certainly into a deep period of soul searching and asking myself the question, if not medicine, then what am I supposed to do with my life? That was very difficult for me, and I really struggled for answers. I chose to switch my major to psychology, not because I felt compelled necessarily to go into the field of psychology, but so I could figure out things for myself, figure out me. <laughs> and so not only did I major in psychology, but minored in Asian American studies. And these studies were really helpful to me, as were also numerous courses in religious studies in those undergraduate years as well. I was finding myself. That's what happened. I was finding myself, finally, and finding myself in the context of some larger plan for my life. Not necessarily a plan of my choosing, but a plan that felt like it was a calling. Mm. You see, I was beginning to understand that choosing to be a pediatrician certainly, I believe, is a worthy life's work, without doubt, unquestionably. Um, but it was not in the cards for me. But I'm glad that it became my younger brother John's calling because I know he is an outstanding and much-loved pediatrician. People um, who are his patients, when we were living in Central California, would tell me, tell me these things all the time. How how wonderful John was as a doctor, and I'm so glad. I was always so glad to hear that. But I realized that pediatrics was not my calling, and therefore, though it would have been a wonderful occupation for me, it would not be what God had in mind for me apparently. So I needed to find my vocation. 
You see, there's a difference between an occupation and a vocation. By definition, an occupation is a job or profession. It's how you occupy your time, how you make ends meet financially. An occupation can be very worthy and important to be sure, but it can be the thing that you choose, not necessarily the thing that was chosen for you. <laughs> in a profound sense, chosen for you by God. The word vocation comes from the Latin root word vocare, which has to do with a calling or a naming by God. So I'm so grateful that I was able to discern my calling because even though the responsibilities of this call to ministry may not always be easy, they are indeed fulfilling and such a blessing to me. And I must say that the call of God is not static, but ever evolving with time and new circumstances and new experiences. This I must say. As I read this beginning to the Moses narrative, we understand that Moses was protected by the providence of God, that God was somehow at work in saving Moses from death, from the genocidal order of the Pharaoh that all firstborn to the Israelites must be slain. This early section of the Moses story, actually not so much slain, but well, killed by being thrown into the river. This early section of the Mo Moses story then includes a lot of smart thinking on the part of Moses' mother who makes a basket sealed with water-repellent bitumen and pitch and hid Moses among the reeds on the bank of the river where the Pharaoh's daughter happened to bathe. Was it the plan of God or the genius of Moses' mother? <laughs> Perhaps both. And was it the care and genius of Moses' sister? to keep an eye on her baby brother, Moses, that he would be safe and be taken in by the Pharaoh's daughter, and then for his sister to offer to find someone um, to nurse the baby boy for the Pharaoh's daughter, which of course then she would run to get Moses' mother, <laughs> whatever it was. God was working in a masterful way through an outstanding play by Moses' sister and mother to not only keep Moses alive, but under the protection of the Pharaoh's daughter and still in the nurturing and upbringing of his own mother. This is indeed the beginning of an amazing story. You see, Moses was born for such a time as that. God's people had, becoming, had become increasingly pressed down by the hand of oppression. Even before Moses um, could talk or even imagine what kind of future God had for him, yet God's promise of freeing God's people from the bonds of slavery was coming in this little one who was drawn from the water. This Moses who was completely oblivious to his destiny and purpose and what good he could and must do in his life. This Moses who was saved by being drawn out of the water would be the one who would save the Israelites through the passage of the water of the Red Sea or the Reed Sea, as many theologians would point out. Moses' purpose was set even before he was conscious of it. The promise of God was in him and would be delivered through him. Friends, I believe that you have a purpose too. We all do. God's promise is in you as well, in each of us. Some of our purpose in life is a common purpose to which we were all born to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. To make a difference in the world by living out the character and nature of God as much as we can 
and as best as we can. That is why we are the church, because of the common convictions and passions that we share together. As Jesus was light to the world, so Jesus reminds us in the Gospel of Matthew that you, you, we are the light of the world. But we may also have, I believe, a unique and a special role in time and history. Perhaps that one that is so unique to you. Maybe your spirit is indeed restless because um, you have been wanting to hear the call that is for you. Toward the end of my undergraduate studies, it beca became clear to me that God really did have a plan for me a calling to go into ordained ministry. If you would have asked me as a child, would I consider being a pastor? I might have laughed it off and said, no way, I don't like speaking in front of people. I get too nervous. But here's the thing that I've come to realize. When you are called by God to do something, it just keeps knocking on your heart, mind, and spirit. It won't let you go. You might try to deny it, fight it, disregard it, but if that is what you are supposed to do with your life, it will be forever a powerful magnet that keeps pulling you in and pulling you back. As St. Augustine once said in his Confessions, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in thee. From my own experience, I can say, if you say yes to God's purpose for your life, you will be provided immeasurable blessing, even if what God has called you to do is not so easy. And that's the thing about a calling. It's not an easy road. Um, there's a lot of things that are unexpected, and oftentimes the road to a call, the journey of a call, is hard. And you will find, but you will find that you are not alone. God is with you, just as he would be with Moses as he grows and heeds God's calling on his life. Somehow, I believe we will be provided all that we need to tend to the tasks that God has laid before us. Crazy that the guy who is scared of speaking in public is one who is uh, reasonably comfortable in doing so now. It's not easy, but it's not terrifying anymore. I have come to affirm that all things are possible if you let God be in control. Humility and obedience can be the soil into which God can do much good. I really do hope that you might consider how God is calling your life, where God is leading you, where God needs you. I know that God can do so much through you, through each of us, because I do believe that the promise and the hope of God has always be, been in you from the time you were born, and even before you were born. May God indeed use each of us to do glorious and redeeming work in the world. So peace and blessing to you as you discern your call or you continue on with the call that you have discerned. God's peace be with you. Amen. Would you please pray with me? God of mercy and grace, please strengthen us in faith. Help us to see ourselves as you see us sacred and worthy, capable, capable of doing much good. Help us to affirm the promise you see in each of us, even though we may not fully understand the call and the journey that you beckon each of us to follow. The call that we share in common and the call that is unique to each of us specifically. Certainly when Moses was born, how could he have known while growing up that God had a great plan for his life, a liberating and life-redeeming plan? 
to confront the oppression of a people. We ask, O oh God, that you open our eyes as well to grow in faith. Help us to attune our eyes, ears, hearts, minds, and spirits to your signs and your voice along our path forward, providing small glints of the lighted path before us, but perhaps later with greater fullness as it becomes a compelling, compelling force that pulls us and will not let us go. Help us with each new experience to see the dots that connect along the journey that in time and in your wisdom opens up for us a clearer picture of your purpose for our lives. And O oh God, when that picture and way is clear, help us to not be afraid, but to have courage, to be instruments of your love and grace to a broken and troubled world, to people who are pressed down by the weight of injustice or illness, confusion, and hopelessness, O oh God, in these days, we pray for the victims of our current California, California wildfires. We pray for the firefighters battling these blazes. We pray, O oh God, that we might all be better unified in thought and actions in our nation in combating the spread of this COVID-19 virus for healthcare workers and essential workers, for teachers and students, for, for all those who are most at risk, please help us to keep each other safe. Help us to desire to keep each other safe. We pray for our economy and the livelihoods of so many who have been devastated or stand on, on the brink of financial ruin. We pray for these months of political campaigning. Help us to wade through the mudslinging Grant that all of us will be able to clearly discern truth and character, honesty, ethical and moral integrity, spiritual grounding, a desire to care for the well-being of all, sound intelligence, ability to reason, strong sense of ethics and willingness to build unity and cooperation among varying and even opposing viewpoints. Indeed, the future of our nation among nations depends much on the leadership that we choose at the state and national levels. So please help us to look to you and the example of Christ to lead us in our decision making. Loving God, please be present with each of us as we lift up to you now in this very moment of silence all of the deep longings of our hearts, both joys and concerns or sorrows that we bring to you this day. Hear now our prayers, O oh God. Again, we ask, O oh God, please hear our prayers as we pray and say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, 
my hand will sing. I will make the stars of night, I will make the darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. I, the Lord of snow and rain, I have borne my people's pain. I have wept for love of them. They turn away. I will break their hearts of stone. Give them hearts for love alone. I will speak my word to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. I, the Lord of wind and flame, I will tend the poor and lame. I will set a feast for them. My hand will sing. Finest bread I will provide till their hearts be satisfied. I will give my life to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my Okay, everybody, please now hear these words of benediction. May God's Spirit indeed send us forth as light unto the world. Help us to be creative, for even in sheltering in place, we believe that we can make a difference. Keep us yoked in spirit, O God, uh, to the compassion of Jesus the Christ that we might be bold in ministry and compassionate in service. In Christ we pray. Amen. Blessings to all of you this week, um, dear friends. Uh, please, please take care. Bye now. Spirit sends us forth to serve, we go in Jesus' name to bring glad tidings to the poor, God's favor to proclaim. We go to comfort those who mourn and set the burden free. 
is dim to share a dream and help the blind to see. We go to be the hands of Christ to scatter joy like seed. And all our days to cherish life, to do the loving deed. Then let us go to serve in peace the gospel to proclaim. God's Spirit has empowered us. We go in Jesus' name.